I'm Tracy E. Gilchrist, and this is Equal Entertainment. Negotiations between Hollywood writers and studios are ongoing, with the writers meeting with studio reps and CEOs. The Writers Guild of America has responded to the latest proposal from the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. The two sides remain far apart on several items, including a staffing minimum in TV and a viewership-based streaming residual. The WGA and the studios are resuming negotiations, while SAG remains dormant on a deal. The heads of Netflix, Warner Brothers Discovery, NBC Universal, and Disney are holding a joint call to discuss what comes next. Paramount Global says it won't sell its majority stake in BET. The entertainment giant notified bidders of the decision, including Tyler Perry, Sean Diddy Combs, and Byron Allen. Perry currently owns a minority stake in BET+. BET has seen a drop in cable subscribers over the last 20 years, going from 90 million viewers in 2014 to 66 million in 2022. BET was created in 1980 by Robert and Sheila Johnson, who sold it to Viacom in 2000 for $3 billion. A new study shows that years of progress toward parity for women, BIPOC people, and LGBTQ people in Hollywood has stalled. USC's Annenberg Inclusion Initiative looked at the top 100 box office films of 2022 and found that Hollywood has a long way to go in terms of inclusivity. The study found that while 44% of leading roles went to women in 2022, the highest number recorded, only 34.6% of speaking parts went to women. That's roughly equal to the 34% in 2019 and 32% in 2008. And only 15% of 2022's top 100 films were gender balanced. As for race and ethnicity, only 31 of the top films in 2022 featured an individual from an underrepresented racial or ethnic group in a lead or co-lead role. That number is down from 37 in 2021. 2022 Black, Hispanic, and Asian characters accounted for 38% of speaking characters. That number underrepresents the population at large. Finally, only 2.1% of speaking characters in the top films of 2022 were LGBTQ+. The report doesn't include films produced for streaming platforms or smaller releases. It's the biggest movie on Prime Video right now and the third biggest rom-com ever on the platform. Red, White, and Royal Blue shows queer-led stories can have major success while staying true to the community. Director Matthew Lopez brings an iconic look to life in this movie, and he tells me about those authentic and intentionally steamy scenes. Yeah, well, I wonder, would you talk a little bit about what grabbed you so deeply about the novel? Yeah, it was it was two things. One, it it was, of course, Alex and Henry and that love story and just the compelling sort of all-encompassing, swoony yeah. quality of that love story. Um, I'm just a sucker and, for that. And I, you know. And, and swoony I, is a word. <laughs> swoony, is, swoony is a word. Uh, Swooniest. Swooniest, yeah. Swooniest, um, sorry. Swooniest. It was the swooniest <laughs> thing. Um, yeah, but it was also, it was Alex himself. Like, I had, you know, I had... I was in my four. I was in my forties, and I had still never read a book until that moment that mm. had a a queer Latine mm. uh, character who is a son of the South, like I am. Like there was just so much overlap, and I had yeah. despaired of ever encountering a story that had a positive mm -hmm. young brilliantly flawed but in the best way possible young latin character and and i just i knew that i had to be the person to bring that into the world yeah wonderful well thank you and would you talk a little bit also i mean the novel was wildly popular and successful <laughs> yeah. and yeah. that is you know a lot of pressure so what was yeah, that like for you? yeah <laughs> what was that like bad. for you going in knowing that fans would have expectations i had to forget about it honestly i had to just forget all about it in order to do my job uh i, I because i think it's it is it, like one of these things where when you're on the tightrope don't look down right um <laughs> yeah I, I would have been tied up in knots if i had allowed myself to think about 
a million millions of people who were eager to see this film and eager to see it done well. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't allow myself to do that because it wouldn't have happened then. I would have frozen. It would have just been self-conscious in some ways, I think. Um, mm. So I decided to treat the story as if it was just a story that I, I had, I, had, I alone had been told and that I alone had access to. As if one day, Casey McQuiston had sat me down and just said, here's a story. And, and, and so that helped because I think that, because oh, eventually over time, once it became public knowledge that the movie was going to be made, then, then a lot of the things were based on it. And by that point, a lot of the intentionality of the film had already been set because the script was written and, and I was well on my way to putting the production together. Yeah. <laughs> so you were, you were right in it. <laughs> yeah, very much right in it. <laughs> Well, I want to touch on something that I've I've read a little bit about and you know some reaction to it. Um, mm -hmm. Well, first off, as you said, it's grand, it's romantic and swoony. Uh, it's also very sexy, and uh, you know I think I read in Vulture that uh, they were happy to see a couple thrusts, like because queer <laughs> queer sex doesn't get that for the most part on screen. I mean, you get yeah. like one kind of very art housey version perhaps sure yeah and then, of course and then you get you know lots of kissing and making out uh yeah. so would you talk and of course you know queer people fought for the right to have sex too i mean that's part of the queer revolution and so i think it's really important that it's in there and would you touch on that piece of the film yeah, I think, look, it's a very important part of Casey's story that these ter these characters have incredibly connected, robust, enjoyable sex. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't even a question of, I knew I had to include it. I knew I wanted to include it. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't a, I have to, it was a, I get to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and when I started to figure out the, the production and, and, and start to put it together. And I started working very early on with a, with an intimacy coordinator with, with, with Robbie Taylor Hunt, who was instrumental in, in helping me create these scenes. Um, we really did sort of sit down and give ourselves a challenge of what are the things that we've never seen in a studio finance movie mm. uh, in a scene between two men? Uh, what are the things that we, may have longed to have, have seen when we were younger and how can we put this into this film in a way that is doesn't feel like out of place with the movie doesn't feel like we've just sort of like shoehorned it in um that is sort of narratively necessary and so it was all everything about it was incredibly intentional but yeah it's like we the thing we came to is like two things one it had to help the audience understand Alex and Henry who they are individually, where they are individually in their, their journeys and when where they are together in their journey of coming together. It also needed to make physical sense. <laughs> because I think sometimes you see love scenes in movies between two men. And it I I you, you can watch you them like... and go, how does that work again? I've never done that. Can <laughs> that how does that work? So um <laughs> <laughs> or they're like, you know, or the assumption is, you know, to sort of borrow from something in the ether right now, or they're like Ken dolls, you know? And yeah. so, you know, and I, I wanted to make sure that we weren't making a movie about two Ken dolls. Uh, yeah. And I love Ken's. We all love Ken's. Yeah. But uh, yeah, when it came enough. to this movie, you know, <laughs> I am Ken Ups. And um, <laughs> but when it came to this movie, we, I mean, quite frankly, Robbie and I, like, we talked about genitalia. Do you know what I mean? We talked about... Mm -hmm. In, we use phrases like moment of insertion. We talked mm -hmm. about breath. We talked about consent. We talked about um, that very vulnerable, beautiful, exciting electric moment when one person enters another person. Uh, and we decided to focus on that and really um, be allow that to be a stand-in for the rest of the sex that they have, as well as allow that to inform the audience as to what precisely is going on inside of their heads and in their hearts. Good Morning America's Gio Benitez is on the cover of the September-October issue of The Advocate. He's one of the more visible queer journalists today, and Benitez doesn't take his role lightly as the new co-anchor of GMA Weekend. 
He says that being his authentic self is essential for him to be in the public eye. You can read the full article and get more behind the scenes footage of the photo shoot on advocate.com. You can watch the Advocate channel live by downloading our app in the Apple or Google Play Store. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Advocate channel, I'm Tracy E. Gilchrist, and thank you for watching.